Corporations are critical players in our economy. They create the wealth, jobs, goods, and services we all need. And increasingly, that's prompted people to see them as not only commercial enterprises, but as key social actors. Sarah Kaplan is a distinguished professor at the University of Toronto's Rotman School of Management and founding director of the school's Institute for Gender and the Economy. Her new book looks at how businesses are confronting some of those new expectations. It's called The 360 Degree Corporation, From Stakeholder Trade-Offs to Transformation. And Sarah Kaplan joins us now for more. So good to have you back here. So great to be here. You start the book with a slogan that you learned when you taught students at the Wharton School in the United States. And the slogan was, learn, earn, return. What does that mean exactly? Well, it's something that the students use to describe their career trajectory. So they'd say, we're here getting our MBAs. We're here to learn. We're going to then go get jobs, earn a lot of money. That was their goal. And then later, once we've established ourselves and have made the money, we're going to return to society, meaning use our money philanthropically to give back and do social good. And that's something that I really wanted to problematize because it's sort of the same thing as in the MBA program when we teach ethics as a separate issue, it compartmentalizes the doing good from the doing business. And so what motivated me to write the book and teach the course and found my institute uh, were all around this question of seeing how those questions are actually integrated and not separate. Well, I did find that interesting that somehow they felt that they couldn't be socially responsible, socially responsible until they made their first millions. Right. And you're uh, presumably trying to chip away at that notion. Yeah, exactly. They yeah. basically said, well, there's no way to make money if we are also paying attention to those other issues. Hmm. Donald Trump went to the Wharton School. Mm -hmm. uh, did he learn, earn, and return? I <laughs> do not wish to comment. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Moving right along. <laughs> Uh, is that still the thinking among the MBA students that you teach in Toronto at Rotman? Uh, I hear it much less now, and I think that's because there's a new generation of students uh, that are thinking in, in a more integrated way. And I also think that society is starting to change. As you said in the intro, we are starting to understand that corporations really are social actors and have a role to play in not only just generating profits for the shareholders, but also in having an impact on the welfare of workers, the uh, workers in the supply chain, on the environment, on gender equality. And so we have to expect more of corporations, and students are coming in to get their business degrees, expecting that they're going to learn how to do that. What do you think prompted that change of view? Uh, I think there's a few things. One, the crises that we're facing are so dire at this point. It's pretty obvious that climate change is going to create massive dislocation globally. That's hugely problematic. Uh, the financial crisis of 2008 also was created a generational shift of people seeing corporations have, as having caused that crisis through their greed, through their bottom line focus. And so I think where we are now is not only the young people who are taking our courses in business schools, but also investors are putting more pressure as well. And society is putting more pressure on on corporations to not just focus on the bottom line. Let's do a story here. Uh out of your book, Walmart, yeah. and how it acted in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. Yeah. Fill us in. So Hurricane Katrina, August 2005, it's anticipated to land in the Gulf. What does Walmart do? What they do best, logistics. They get all the products that they need into the stores, the tarps, the, the flashlights, the water, the strawberry Pop-Tarts, the <laughs> kinds of things that people need during a hurricane. The hurricane hits, and they move again into one of their areas of excellence, which is loss control, getting the cash out of the stores, preventing looting. But then the scale of the human disaster really unfolded. Mm -hmm. And they quickly shifted into getting supplies, food, water, the kinds of things into the various communities that were hard hit. In fact, very often they were there before FEMA, which is the US Federal Emergency Management Agency, was there. And they got an incredible amount of positive press for that. And many people said, look, if the US government had operated the way Walmart operated, we wouldn't have had the crisis that we had in Katrina. Now, some people, why this story is kind of complicated is because some people then criticized Walmart for getting a lot of credit for it. They said, look, it's the least they could do. They get a lot of subsidies to operate in these areas. Uh, they should be doing these kinds of things. Or they got so much positive PR, any cost they bore was more than paid off with the free advertising that they got at the good of the company. But it was this critical turning moment in Walmart where the senior leadership basically said, hey, wait a minute, we mobilized our best capabilities to do something that was good for society. 
what if we thought more comprehensively in our whole business about it? And that's when they ended up launching their zero waste initiative, their 100% uh, renewable energy initiative, their women's economic uh, empowerment initiative. And they have basically understood that doing good doesn't have to be separate from doing business. They can actually mobilize their business capabilities to actually uh, reduce the harm that their company creates or create social good. I don't mean this as a horrible pun, but it was a watershed moment for them in some respects as a corporation. Absolutely, and they will say, they describe it that way. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about, uh, I mean, you do talk about, it's in the subtitle of the book, the stakeholders who are all a part of this mm -hmm. equation that you're referring to. So let's just get a better understanding of who they are. The stakeholders, from stakeholder yeah. to trade-offs to transformation, who are they? So the stakeholders we should understand is any people, actors, entities that are being affected by the operations of the company but may not have any ownership control. So we think of the shareholders as the people who own, who get the benefits if the stock price goes up, who get dividends. And then you have the stakeholders who could be employees, the communities in which companies uh, operate, uh, workers in the supply chain, the environment are all stakeholders because they are affected by the operations of the company. So when we talk about stakeholder trade-offs, what we're basically saying is tensions that are created between the different stakeholders or between the stakeholders and the shareholder. And those tr trade-offs, well, I should say, those, those tensions are in some respects supposed to be there, aren't they? They don't all have the same end goal in mind. The, by definition, there are going to be conflicts. Yeah. One of the big issues is that companies often don't understand that they are creating those trade-offs when they make business decisions. So there's plenty, you know, we want same-day delivery for our products. You know, that's really great. It benefits us as consumers. It benefits the company because they get more sales. But it might not be so good for the workers who are doing the deliveries. We know that some of their work conditions are very poor. It's bad for pollution. It's bad for congestion in the city. And so those are trade-offs. If we want same-day delivery, we're accepting some of those other aspects. And yet, not so often do people actually think about, analyze, and understand that those are the trade-offs that are embedded in a, in a decision. You want to do a real-life example on, on that kind of issue? Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, on, a, on a kind of trade-off? Yeah. Well, for example, well, the same-day delivery is one I think about all the time because I love it, but then I also feel like it's usually problematic, so it feels like an ethical issue to me. Mm -hmm. I almost can't get, I can't not get same-day delivery because of, they don't even offer a slow, more efficient, less polluting option, <laughs> and that's something that companies could think about. But think about also, like, a high-performance running shoe. You go running, you don't want your shoe to fall apart, you want it to serve you very well, mm -hmm. but maybe to get that high-performance running shoe, you also need and to have, uh, it has to have glues in it that hold. Well, maybe those glues are toxic. Well, if the t glues are toxic, it might be bad for the environment and it might be bad for the workers who are assembling the shoes. But I still want my shoe to function well. So mm -hmm. those are some other examples of, of trade-offs that can happen. What's the right answer? Well, that's what I talk about in my book, uh, that th there's not a right answer. I actually say in the book, this is not a simple story, and you're not supposed to write business books that don't have simple stories. I try to simplify it down into some questions and frameworks that people can think about. But the first right answer is to actually know what the trade-offs are. <laughs> so if you haven't thought about it, analyzed it, you don't know what impact you're having. Do you think, uh, let me just jump yeah. in, do, do you think companies understand the trade-offs as they're doing what they do? I don't think it's part of the conversation very they often. They don't think about it. No. Hmm. I think mostly people see corporate social responsibility or ethical action as something they do on the side uh, or they sprinkle on top of their activities, but they don't understand that every decision they make has embedded in it those trade-offs. And so, so it I think needs that what to be I, integral to what they do. Every decision should have that conversation hmm. in it, in my in my view and what I'm recommending to companies, because I think the moment you have the conversation, you can start thinking about solutions. Um, and so then I talk about most companies, again, when they then start thinking about solutions, think they need to make the business case for it. They need to prove that it's good for the bottom line. And what I say is actually that's going to lead to very incremental action. Uh, another mistake that <clears throat> companies make is, as I said, treating it as an add-on as opposed to central to the business. And I think if you treat it as central, it can really lead to transformational ideas if you actually put it on the table and look at it. And then I think the other mistake that I talk about that I you know, hope that you know, will help managers think differently about this is um, that they get, when they don't see a solution, they just stop. And what I'm saying is don't just stop. Actually, this is the perfect moment. Those impasses are perfect moments for experimentation, for 
you know, thriving within the tensions and the contradictions because those are what are going to create the solution. So I try to, even though it's complicated, I try to give people some handholds to go through. I know when you gave the example a few moments mm -hmm. ago about about how you love whatever the product is right. and you want it right now and you get right. it right now, but you understand that that might cause more pollution. I mean, Uber Eats jumped into my mind, right. which which you know, if it takes off as much as Uber has, are going to have just lots of cars on the road delivering lots of meals to lots of people in a very timely way. And presumably, unless they're all battery-powered cars, they're going to be increasing the pollution on our roads to some extent. If a company... Now, I don't know how well you know the Uber situation, but do you think that that conundrum is something that they think about when they, under, when they decided we're not just going to take people around, but we're going to take food all over the place as well? You know, I, I don't know the inside of Uber as well as... I mean, I talk in much more detail in the book about Walmart and about Nike and in, in, in actually pretty great depth. But... I think sometimes those conversations aren't being had because they're so excited about this idea that they can deliver product right to the door and there's a whole bevy of people who seem to be willing to do that work and so I'm not sure that that conversation is always there. But we do know, for example, Amazon is experimenting with drones, mm -hmm. right? So if a drone would be more efficient in delivering it than you know, car power delivery of products, maybe that's a creative and innovative solution. Now, there's probably other externalities I created by drones. Say, unless you're in the so, military and you wonder about all these drones flying around. Right. So every decision will have all of these mm -hmm. other issues in it. And what I'm advocating for is actually having those on the table as part of the discussion as opposed to on the side and not looked at. Hmm. Okay. I want to know who you wrote this book for. Mm -hmm. So I wrote this book. It came out of a course that I taught that I teach on the corporation society. So in some ways, it's very motivated by my students who are the future leaders in business. It's also for the CEO who is feeling pressure from all sides. Even investors are now sovereign wealth funds and major investment houses are saying, you need to also do purpose as well as profit. Um, so it's for the, the uh, business leaders at all levels who are going to have to do this. I want to give them the tools to be able to say, there are ways to have this conversation and there are actions you can take that mean that this is not just social responsibility where you go to a, a charity event and give yourself an award, but something that you actually embed into your own business. And so the book is really meant to be that practical how. People want to do it. They have the right intentions. They don't know how. This is geared at the how. But I also end the book with an epilogue, which is for the, us individuals as citizens, not necessarily as workers, as citizens in society because companies are constantly implicitly or explicitly making these trade-offs and they have financial calculations. We can actually change those calculations either through our consumer behavior. Mm -hmm. So for example, Walmart says that when they brand a product as having been produced by a woman-led company, it has greater sell-through. So we as consumers are putting our dollars in a place that's actually driving business towards women-led businesses. Or you look at Shell Oil, when they decided to pull out from some of their Arctic drilling, they said the cost-benefit analysis wasn't there anymore. But part of the reason the cost-benefit analysis wasn't there was because Greenpeace had activists who were dangling themselves off of bridges in Portland, Oregon, preventing the equipment from actually getting to the place, which created social uh, uh, public relations costs, and it created actual logistics costs. So we as individuals can also learn from this book about how corporations work and make their decisions so that we can work to shape it in the ways that we think meet our values. I must confess, when I was reading it, I thought to myself, every corporate executive who's got an ounce of corporate social responsibility in her genes uh, will read this book, and they're not the ones who need to. The right. ones who need to read it probably aren't going to read it, or at least that's what I thought. Right. Is it, is it my guess, or I guess it is my guess, that you would love to see this book in the hands of people who don't really think much about corporate responsibility, but ought to? Yes, absolutely. I think that where the rubber meets the road is often not at the most senior levels, even though I think the CEOs are the ones who set the tone and fly air cover. It's middle management. The people who are actually making these decisions minute by minute in their jobs, uh, they don't necessarily always have the time or have the tools to be able to think about these issues. And I want them to have the time and the tools, and hopefully this will help. But I, th I hope that CEOs read it too, and I hope that you know, people who are just interested in the impact of corporations and society who are maybe not in corporate leadership will also read it because then they'll understand more to have how to 
shape the corporate action as well. Well, you very kindly kept it to fewer than 200 pages, so yes. even the busy corporate executive can read this book. It's meant to be very readable. It's yeah. quite chatty and based on storytelling because I think that you can't learn. I can give you a framework, but you can't learn it until you see the examples. So the idea is to actually show how this complexity plays out. Right. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.